everyone. My name is Cheryl Tansil, and it's an honor for me to be your moderator for today. On behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Indonesia, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this program. I would also love to welcome all participants from 21 countries all over the world, including Australia, Brunei Darussalam, Cambodia, Chile, People's Republic of China, Fiji, Finland, India, Indonesia, Japan, Lao People's Democratic Republic, Malaysia, Philippines, Republic of Korea, Singapore, South Africa, Thailand, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Vietnam. We hope you will enjoy our discussion today. Our speakers today will focus on how false information impacts the governments and other stakeholders, for example, in the event of disasters or protecting citizens abroad. As we know, big data consists of information from all over the world. How to manage big data becomes an important thing as the false information could escalate into a crisis. At this moment, it would be a great opportunity for us to learn more about how to manage the big data effectively and to manage the crisis that could escalate from the false information. Today, I have four esteemed speakers joining me, each with their respective expertise on big data. Let me introduce our speakers today. My first panelist, he holds a master degree in public health and has been working with the Ministry of Health of Republic of Indonesia for almost two decades. Please welcome the head of Data and Information Center, Ministry of Health Indonesia, Dr. Anas Ma'ruf. <laughs> And my next panelist is a prominent researcher and author on the issue of digital diplomacy. He has served as a consultant or trainer for ministries of foreign affairs and diplomatic academies in several countries. Please welcome Associate Professor in Diplomatic Studies at the University of Oxford and head of the Oxford Digital Diplomacy Research Group, Professor Cornelio Biola. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, Professor. And my next panelist, she's working in a joint data innovation facility of the United Nations and Government of Indonesia, Pulse Lab Jakarta. Please welcome Partnership and Advocacy Lead, Pulse Lab Jakarta, Indonesia, Ms. Femi Sumantri. Hello, Ms. Femi. Hello, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. And lastly, we have a lead author of the 2020 system-wide roadmap for innovation, UN data and statistics. Please welcome Director of Data and Analytics, World Health Organization, Dr. Steve McFeely. Hello, Dr. Steve. Hello, everybody. And before I give the time to our speakers, I would like to remind you that the discussion will take place after all the, present, the presentation are delivered completely by our speakers. And to the speakers, I would like to kindly remind you that due to the time constraint, you will have to deliver your presentation no more than seven minutes. And distinguished participants, without further ado, please welcome our first speaker, Dr. Anas Maruf. Good Dr. Anas? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, moderators. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my introduce my name Anas Ma'ruf. Uh, I'm a director of Center for Data and Information, Ministry of Health, Republic of Indonesia. Uh, please share the presentation. Excellencies, distinguished uh, speakers, delegate, and uh, participant. Okay. 
in the first slide i think in the era industrial revolution 4.0 indonesia has started to develop digital health here we will uh, share about big data and business management in indonesia we start uh, with indonesia one health data uh, policy ladies and gentlemen i think indonesia have uh, some of regulation about the one data health about the data governance it governance and also health information system governance this regulation very very important to enhance the good governance in indonesia also in our national uh, development to strengthening good governance is in a mainstream to achieve national development toward SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide, please. This slide shows that uh, we have uh, big data for supporting One Health data. Uh, in the era of the Industrial Revolution 4.0, Health Ministry has started to size big data to support Indonesia One Health policy. At this early stage, big data will be implemented in data management processing that are known as a policy cycle. This management processes are continuous and repeated as required. All data that has been collected in processes and increased its quality and stored in the data lake and then processed according to need. Data processing at the policy cycle began with the process of cleaning data and store it in data mark. The next step of the data that collected in the data mark is data mining and put in in the decision support system. Based on the decision support system and policy cycle, health data can be used as an information, knowledge, and also uh, even wisdom. Next. This is shown to us that uh, Indonesia has a lesson learned to use the big data for against the COVID-19 pandemic. Indonesia has uh, three main strategies, sorry, four main strategies to against COVID-19 with the information system. The first strategy is uh, tracing, testing, and treatment. For the strategies, we use the information system like Silacak. Kan informasi sistem seperti Silacak, lalu uh, Ormar, Siranap, Sis Online, Telemedicine, yang juga merupakan. The second uh, strategies is vaccination. For this strategies, Indonesia untuk strategi ini Indonesia memiliki aplikasi tunggal. Namanya adalah Sistem Informasi Satu Data Vaksinasi COVID-19. Dan sistem ini atau aplikasi ini berisi empat layanan seperti peduli lindungi, key care vaksinasi, dan juga distribusi vaksin. Imunisasi logistik secara elektronik. The third strategy is Health protocol with using peduli lindungi is a single platform. And then the fourth strategy is surveillance at the country entrance and genome sequencing with using the quarantine information system, also uh, genome sequencing information system. Four strategies uh, very, very uh, important to against COVID-19 in Indonesia. Next slide. The slide shows that uh, we uh, use the three main data yeah, uh, for the uh, against of COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, three main data as basis data like uh, certificate of vaccination, also test COVID uh, result, and also uh, the the result of the close contact tracing. Yeah. Uh, we use the silacak for the close contact tracing. In managing the health crisis, big data analysis is used to prevent and control COVID-19. 
For example, uh, we can use in the slide that uh, we use the three basis data uh, and integrated uh, to against the COVID-19 pandemics. Yeah. So <clears throat> the three main data we use to uh, COVID-19 recording and reporting, contact tracing that integrated with Silaca, electronic health alert card, when you check in with QR code, self is solution telemedicine, also COVID-19 research and development. Next slide, please. Also, Indonesia has a single platform. Uh, maybe you know that we have uh, Padulindungi. Padulindungi is a single IT platform to prevent and control COVID-19. The Padulindungi contains for uh, some of feature uh, include vaccine certificate, COVID-19 test result, electronic health alert card, check-in history, also travel regulation, etc. All Indonesian people and foreigners can access it. This application also uh, available in another uh, language like English, Chinese, Japanese, and will follow in uh, will follow in several other language. This application also uh, use using the standard vaccine certificate, uh, and also this uh, application integrated with custom and immigration, and will be integrated with other uh, countries. So now we use the Peduli as a single platform to control. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Ladies and gentlemen, based on the experience of fighting COVID-19, a health transformation is needed. Also, it is necessary to support innovation and use of technology. With the vision of create a healthy, productive, independent, and just society, there are five outcomes and six major categories in transformation of health system in Indonesia. The six major categories are primary health care transformation, several health service transformation, health security system transformation, health financing system transformation, health human resource transformation, and health technology transformation. For all major categories in health transformation, it is necessary to support the use of technology, including the transformation of health technology itself. Next slide. I'm sorry, Dr. Maruf, I have to remind you, you have one more minutes. Okay. This is a song that we have three uh, main priority program, yeah, like integration and development of health data system, also integration and development of health service application, and uh, also how to make the health technology ecosystem development. Uh, and last slide, please. Next, yeah. This is summary for my uh, presentation that uh, regarding to the big data using, and then uh, for the uh, how to improve uh, our technologies. Uh, first, that information technology continues to grow. We must use the health services. And second, require data integration, application system integration, and also supporting ecosystem. The third, digital health regulation must be agile. And fourth, utilization big data is necessary. Also, internet of things, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Fifth, health data is strategic data that needs security. So protection and confidentiality is necessary. And the sixth, digital accessibility at all stakes of the life cycle need to be improved. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Maruf, for your presentation. And I will now invite the second speaker in the panel, Professor Cornelio Biola. Professor, uh, you have seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, 
Hello everyone and thank you very much for inviting me. Hello everyone and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, panel, um, in very interesting panel. What I'd like to talk about in my next uh, seven minutes is about the lessons. The lessons that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs can draw from the way in which uh, disinformation has been managed during the COVID-19 pandemic and more specifically how big data analysis can help with that. So uh, this point that I'm going to mention, I'm drawn from my research, mainly on European countries, but I think that uh, their relevance is, is, uh, is broader in scope. So I think four lessons, I think, from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs that can draw from understanding how this information has been managed uh, in European context. The first lesson is about time. Time is of the essence, um, and even more so in the case of countering disinformation. So in a study that I recently completed, I discovered that countries in Europe uh, spent an average of 20 days in March 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, to get a sense of the gravity of the situation. So 20 days from the moment they, they started to learn that the pandemic has uh, become a problem in Asia, by the time they started to take um, actions to, um, to, to react more properly. And I think this kind of, this lag was significant. It, uh, it, uh, the slow reaction proved deeply problematic uh, at the time because it allowed this information uh, to, to get a head start. At the end of March 2019, the first conspiracy theory started to hit uh, the digital medium. Uh, and um, in, in this information research, the sooner you are able to, to, to grapple with this information, the better. So the question then has become, you know, why the significant lag? How to cope with the significant, uh, with, the, with the slow reaction? How to make sure that you are actually able to understand the severity, the, the severity of the crisis and to react to that more promptly? Uh, and I think here's uh, the lessons. And I think, especially when we talk about big data analysis, it's about monitoring information from other countries already affected. And this is where the network of embassies could actually serve as sensors. Sensors that are able to capture you know, the, 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 what is going on in the countries. And this information has to be fed back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for real-time analysis. That's one thing that I've seen uh, in terms of the problems of identifying the gravity, the severity of a crisis and being able to react more promptly, more uh, effectively. A second lesson has to do with the fact that uh, during the pandemic, we've seen Ministry of Foreign Affairs being requested to talk more with uh, the domestic audiences rather than with the foreign audiences. And why was that? Because most of the disinformation during the pandemic was not state sponsored. As in the previous years, we have attempts by other hostile countries, for instance, to steer trouble, to produce instability through the disinformation in Europe. But during the pandemic, that was not the case. Most of the disinformation was homegrown. Uh, we've seen a number, the explosion of conspiracy theories at that time. And we know from studies that uh, in times of crisis, conspiracy theories strike. People feel confused, uh, they lack certainty. And because of that, they, 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 they sometimes you know, these, these, these conspiracy theories provide easy answers. So what I think the lessons here is that uh, it's, it uh, needs to be explained what is going on again, you know, in terms of how other countries have coped with restriction measures, how other countries have coped with the, with the, the vaccination process. So again, you know, monitoring and explaining to the domestic audiences what is going on in other countries goes a long way uh, in terms of being able to counter some or to contain some of the more toxic uh, conspiracy narratives uh, that we've seen. Uh, so again, this is a, a, an important role that Ministry of Foreign Affairs have discovered, at least in Europe, the need to talk with domestic audiences in collaboration with other domestic institutions and to identify right measures that have taken by other countries in order to be able to uh, explain their public uh, and to um, contain the, as I said, you know, the conspiracy uh, disinformation aspect. The third element, the third lesson is capacity building through regional collaboration. Um, um, th there was a case, for instance, um, um, with, the, with the disinformation that we've seen 
uh, spreading from country to country. It's the same type of narrative, but it reaches countries differently. The one that I'm looking for is at the moment I'm examining is the depopulation conspiracy narrative that is started, for instance, in uh, March 20, uh, uh, 2020 in North America, and now is, has become quite popular in Europe. So what I'm saying with this is that, you know, regional collaboration can help because the type of narrative that hit you, they already hit, you know, other countries around you. In Europe, for instance, the European Action Service has set up a system, a system that draws on, uh, you know, builds on regional collaboration, it's called a rapid alert system. And uh, the, what it tries to do is to put together, you know, to uh, all the, the member states to uh, share substantial disinformation campaigns, to increase situational awareness and to design common approaches and responses to disinformation. So having a system that can be fed from different uh, member states, right? From different uh, partners with what is going on, then can give a head start can, uh, to other members about what kind of issues may arise and actually how to deal with them more proactively before they hit you. Um, and finally, I should stress another important lesson, the fourth one that we've seen, at least in Europe, is a question of collaboration with big tech companies. Um, this information is too massive, and we have to realize that it circulates on platforms which Ministry of Foreign Affairs cannot control. That is a, a, a big problem. In at the height of the crisis, for instance, in UK, the country I'm based, 50% of UK adults say they said content they intensified as misleading information. So what the UK government has done in that case is to partner with uh, uh, tech companies to work together by alerting, by trying to remove some of the more corrosive uh, 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 system from their platforms. Why is that important? Because it tells Ministry of Foreign Affairs they have to do a lot of preparation uh, uh, in anticipation of future crises. And at this, you know, the developing, cultivating a strong relationship with tech companies. There are about 20 tech ambassadors around the world. The first one starting, you know, in, 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 uh, in 2017 with Denmark, but now there are about 20,000. that I'm they sorry, try I have to, to remind this. you about the time. And I'm going to, uh, to conclude, you know, uh, just to, to summarize, you know, what you need to do in terms of, you know, uh, coping with this information, um, uh, use embassies, network of embassies as data sensors, talk with domestic audiences and monitor what happens in other countries, uh, work with others to build capacity, and don't forget about the tech, tech companies in terms of um, cultivating relationship with them. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. And for the next speaker, please welcome Ms. Femi Sumantri. Ms. Femi, you have seven minutes presentation. The screen is yeah, yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, moderator. Um, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, and also distinguished speaker, um, I'm very honored to be here uh, today to represent uh, the Post Lab Jakarta and uh, presenting our portfolio on big data for crisis response. Next, please, can I have the slides? Thank you. Yeah, we can move to the next slide. Um, please allow me to introduce the organization to you. So Pulse Lab Jakarta is part of the UN Global Pulse, um, situated also um, under the uh, Executive Office of the Secretary General of the United Nations, in which uh, we employ a mixed method approach through which it harnesses advanced data analytics to obtain actionable insight from big data. And also we apply surface design to better understand the end-to-end -end processes and resources required for surfaces to run and generate value as well as for sustainability, for sure. And these insights are used to inform decisions and policy making on a range of development and humanitarian issues, including during crisis. So the lab functions to drive exploratory research, facilitate partnership between uh, and among the stakeholders, and also identifying new data sources and ensuring ethical use of data. Next, please. Yeah. Um, this is where uh, we take uh, some of our experience on the data flow in disaster or crisis settings. 
we divided the phase into the pre-crisis, during crisis and post-crisis, in which we can see here that uh, secondary data and primary data um, also are all uh, interlinked and interconnected during the analytics of the, the crisis timing. And uh, this is where we thought that uh, a combination of traditional and non-traditional data is really play an important role in the analytics of the crisis itself. Next, please. Next slide, thank you. Yeah, this is just a mapping of, uh, to show us as well the importance of data analytics in times of crisis. So um, this is the use of big data analytics for uh, emergency prediction, for uh, providing and monitoring aid, for example, during crisis, and um, as well as analysis of recovery plan for sure. And this also uh, applies to the COVID-19 analytics. Um, the examples of uh, some of the works that we have done um, in terms of crisis, not merely on COVID, uh, that will be explained on the later slides. Uh, these are here, and uh, some technologies that uh, te some technologies and data use are uh, very various, and also uh, it entails the non-conventional data that uh, I was explaining uh, uh, earlier. Next, please. Yeah, uh, on the haze gazer, I think I have to agree with uh, Professor Cornelio that the immediate aftermath of uh, the onset crisis is a critical period of time when the humanitarian donor communities need to make a key decision on how to best support affected country. And this haze gazer was the first platform in Indonesia that combined satellites image and social data to provide real time insights on potential disaster. It's on fire and it's hotspot. Uh, I also identified uh, most vulnerable cohorts. Uh, it was installed in the executive office of the president of Indonesia and later on adopted by other countries like Mongolia for their natural disaster uh, analytics. Next, please. Uh, Vampire is the vulnerability assessment monitoring platform for the impact of regional events. Uh, it was developed uh, in collaboration uh, with the World Food Program and it provided integrated map-based visualization that show the extent of drought uh, affected areas, the impact on markets and the coping strategies of affected population in Indonesia. And um, this has served as early warning system to some extent, and it has been scaled up to, to Sri Lanka and also to other regions as well, like Asia Pacific, as well as uh, uh, Africa through the WFP or World Food Program uh, works under PRISM. It's another version of Empire called Platform for Real-Time Impact and Situation Monitoring. Next, please. And with the Central Sulawesi migration, for example, we uh, sort of like um, identifying the mobility patterns and we work with a mobile telecom Digicel at that time. So this is also to highlight the need for data partnership agreements before the onset of a disaster. And um, we can actually uh, identify internal displacement. And this has been also um, uh, moving into other uptake and scaling on other tools as well, in adapting to other tools. Thank you. Next one. And on mine, uh, this is managing information for natural disaster. Uh, we would like to highlight the benefit of a real-time sensing data pipeline that combines various data sources. And uh, this is also uh, to show that better management of information on informing responders following the natural disasters or any kind of crisis with timely insights on affected areas, the, the need of communities and others as well. And uh, this is to complement existing disaster response tools and can be modified into uh, meeting the specific needs of an organization in order to decide on the intervention towards uh, any kind of crisis. Next, please. Um, in terms of COVID, uh, we basically work with West Jaffa at that time, uh, West Jaffa, uh, government uh, through the Jabba Digital Services or West Jaffa Digital Services. And um, what we did uh, that we, we, we sort of realized that the pandemic has brought data innovation to the fore. 
and much of the demand has been to leverage alternative data of high spatial and temporal resolution. And this is where we combine um, we combine directly the uh, the, the non-conventional data into the conventional data. At that time, we work with Facebook on mobility data. We use Waze traffic data. Waze is a, a national traffic data uh, startup. And also the other one as with village potential data. Uh, this is uh, a, an official data from the Central Bureau of Statistics. And it was adopted and integrated into PICOBAR. PICOBAR is the Information and Coordination Center for Disease and Disaster in West Java. It can be used by public. The public can uh, use it uh, in different way that they would like the information to be displayed on. And the insight were used as well for the social restriction enforcement by the task force of West Java. Thank you, next. I guess this is very important. Baseline assessment on COVID-19 reporting. It has been um, identified a broad range of underlying issues in Indonesia's public data information uh, that are um, issues of interoperability, data standards, data sharing agreements, and it shows the digital divide within the country and how um, a different a province or different region can act differently uh, and in line with uh, their capacity of um, addressing or managing information with their capacity as well to actually uh, undertake the mitigation of the COVID-19 at that time. Thank you. Next. Ms. Femi, I need to yes. remind your time. Your time yes. is up. Thank you. You can continue yeah. for a while. One minute. All right. Yeah, this is digital diplomacy that we did with the uh, Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think we can go to the next one, the most important one, I suppose. Sorry for the time. Next, please. Um, next, please. Yeah, just, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so the combination of our experience shows a number of aspects to be addressed, like false information or infodemic, uh, public-private partnership, digital divide, transnational issues, and we reflected on this and various components are interlinked and needs to be addressed. So we think a crisis response as an ecosystem and these are the various aspects to be undertaken. Strengthen bilateral and multilateral cooperation, create an enabling environment, combine conventional and non-conventional data, establish shared value humanitarian data partnership and also develop data innovation solution for impact. And I thought that in the crisis, what we need to do to mitigate the crisis is actually building resilience. And that's how um, data innovation can do as well and can be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sumantri. And I will invite my last speaker, Dr. Steve McFeely. <laughs> Hello again, Dr. Steve. You have seven minutes presentation. The screen is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. And thank you for the invitation to speak. So I, I'd like to talk in, in a more general way than the other speakers about some of the, the, the preparation around big data. So I don't, well, I don't know if you can see the slides. So next slide, please. So, the concept of data has broadened over the last 20 years. So, so now the digital revolution has generated a supply side data revolution. So now data is made up of sound, of images, of text, of numbers. And this all generates enormous potential. Um, but the growth in data has also been matched by enormous expectations of what big data, what big data can do. And I think in some cases, these expectations are unrealistic. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment. So next slide, please. So the growth in data, although exponential and absolutely massive, in some ways gives a false picture of the real data availability. Um, a lot of the tailpipe data is generated by duplicates, by bot generated data, um, echo chambers and so forth. So there's a lot of noise buried um, within big data. An important consideration from a UN perspective is that the digital divide has created a data divide. 
And that data divide often hides the most vulnerable um, and excludes them uh, from our big data sets. And this is very important when we're looking at uh, issues from a global perspective. Next slide, please. And this really is the, the important thing. In recent years, we, we've seen a change in the use of language. So 20 years ago, we would have talked about data to inform decision-making. Now we talk about data-driven decision-making and that's conceptually a very different thing. And this emerges from the growth of algorithms and, and the use of automatic, automated decision-making. Um, Tufeki calls, uh, he describes algorithms as semi-savant mini Frankensteins because of the concerns around what's buried inside an algorithm, because every algorithm is, is human made. So I think key lessons for decision makers when they're thinking about the use of big data in a crisis context. First of all, governments need to secure access uh, to data. Often securing access takes time. There's a lot of data protection issues. So waiting for a crisis, it, it's often too late. And I think this is the point that Professor uh, Bola was making. So governments need to think or anticipate what types of data do they need to secure access to? And so they need to prepare legislation in advance um, so that they can get access to the data. Secondly, in the, in the heat of a crisis, there's always a tendency, the public, they, they want answers quickly, but governments need to be very careful in doing that, that they, they always take account of good governance. So they don't compromise on human rights and ethical issues when they're using uh, these large data sets. Thirdly, they always need to be skeptical. Um, as I mentioned, big data sets have a lot of biases, a lot of issues. So jumping to conclusions um, using the data, it's always going to lead to mistakes. So you need to be very careful and interrogate the data. And, and this is why using data to inform decisions rather than drive decisions is very important. Um, so they need to be conscious of using data. And this often takes time. You, oftentimes you need to experiment with the, with the data set for quite a long time before you really begin to understand how it behaves. So using, using a data set that you've never used in a crisis could, can often be problematic. Finally, or well, almost finally, I think the national statistical offices should be pivotal to this work. Um, I, I know we're talking about digital diplomacy, but to me, ministries of foreign affairs are not the appropriate government arm to be doing these types of work. Uh, foreign affairs are not prepared that generally statistical literacy isn't as strong as it would be in a statistical office. So they're, they're not the appropriate arm of government to do these type of work. And finally, I, I think as a final message is just be humble. Um, and remember that data don't make decisions and they only inform decisions. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And I'm still waiting for your question. Please, you can drop it on the chat box below. And while we are waiting for another question or comments to come to me, I would love to explore more into the fourth presentation. Um, maybe I will go to Dr. McFeely. You said that the current affair is not in the right position to decide about the security of the data. Is that what you mean? Please elaborate more. Yeah, what I mean is, in my experience, foreign affairs don't tend to have very strong statistical experience or expertise. So they may play an important role in terms of building partnerships uh, with donors, with other countries. But they're, they're not necessarily the appropriate office to do the statistical work. So this is where either you bring in academia or you bring in the National Statistical Office. Um, but I, I don't think the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are the people that should do the data analysis. I don't think uh, typically that they have the skill sets required. Okay, thank you, doctor. I would love to go back to Dr. Anas. Um, Dr. McFeely said that in terms of using big data, we have to still concern about not to violate the human rights. 
and we know that a couple of months ago in Indonesia we have the issue that the data has been leaked through our it's a massive application we have the COVID, traf, uh, COVID tracking application with 13 million applicants could you please uh, Dr. Anna share your insight how do you deal with the accusation of data leaked in the government and what did you and your team did that time as the crisis management? Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Or uh, maybe you, uh, maybe you can unmute your okay, speaker sorry. first. Yeah, sorry, much. Okay. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, doctor. Could you yeah. please? Um, yeah, thank you for for again? your okay. question, Dr. Yeah, about the big data, I think it's very, very, uh, very necessary, very important. Uh, we have uh, experience about the uh, uh, data COVID-19. You know that uh, many uh, application, uh, many uh, uh, <clears throat> startup, yeah, that uh, use the the application for the give the information to uh, to public. So uh, have um, uh, Ministry of Health also has uh, big data using the big data to to consist uh, the many many information yeah from the uh, government side from the public side side also from the uh, another like social media side yeah uh, so we uh, uh, compile yeah the data to the leak data yeah you know that uh, for the against COVID nineteen uh, we use three main data like a uh, test result of COVID-19, also a certificate of vaccination and uh, the result of the uh, tracing of uh, uh, close contact. Yeah. So uh, the three data we use to uh, uh, tracing, tracking and uh, fencing uh, to, uh, to against the spread of the pandemic COVID-19. Yeah. So the three main data we use to uh, and uh, the Putri uh, Rigi is uh, one uh, example for using big data uh, to uh, against pandemic COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anas. And I have a question from the floor. I would love to address uh, this to Professor um, Biola. How crucial would infrastructure readiness and quality of human resources in <laughs> guaranteeing <laughs> the reliability <laughs> in the big data in Sorry. Okay, let me continue. I will reply my question. How crucial would infrastructure readiness and quality of human resources in guaranteeing the reliability of the big data in crisis management? Uh, thank you very much Professor? for the question. Um, thank you very much for the question. I think it builds on the point raised before by um, uh, Mr. McPhilly um about the fact that ministry of foreign affairs whether they are well equipped ministry of foreign affairs to deal with the new type of uh data analysis that is required and i think the bag is a little bit mixed just to give an example in 2019 the uk ministry of foreign affairs FCO, actually established a big data analytical unit inside the mso and the reason they established because they wanted to assist decision making with problems of disinformation related to the war in Syria and not only. So the point here is that you know you can create and some other units, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know? some other Ministry of Foreign uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs are looking into the same problem, into the same uh, type of of uh, uh, institutional capacity building measures. The issue for many is that it's very difficult. You need um, uh, to, to have very skillful uh, uh, people to work for you and uh, retaining talent in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not easy. So this is uh, uh, one approach. The second approach is to build partnership. Um, as one of the speaker mentioned, you need to create data agreements, to put data agreements in place before, you know, uh, not during the crisis, but before that. Data agreements, I should stress, this is crucially important nowadays. 
uh, in the context of the privacy related to data management and use. In Europe, for instance, Europe has uh, concluded about seven or eight data equivalency agreements with Japan, with Korea, with, Korea, with uh, Australia, so that the data that it collects or you know shares with other um, uh, countries could be uh, uh, you know legally uh, used. So I think there is an important aspect of putting in place uh, measures, partly as an infrastructure, but also in terms of agreements that you need to do. So there is a lot of work to be done, as my as, uh, as the other speakers mentioned, before we even think about uh, reaching the point of the crisis. And that has to do with building this capacity now, not next week, not when the crisis comes. Thank you, Professor. And we have the second question. I would love to address this question to Ms. Femi Sumantri and also Dr. McFeely. How the government should start its approach in collecting data from massively diverse society? Ms. Femi, your turn first. Thank you. Um, I'd like to try to answer these questions. I guess uh, we started with the thing that COVID-19 crisis it, it, it somehow could be called as data-driven pandemic. And like every disaster or every crisis, it is also an opportunity to focus interest and investment. And that includes uh, collecting data from um, the, the massive or big or uh, very diverse population as well. Um, I guess uh, I'd like to also address what uh, Dr. Stephen mentioned on um, how the, perhaps the Minister of Foreign Affairs is not an appropriate ministry to actually conduct that analytics. I suppose that uh, diplomacy is evolving, uh, things also evolving as well. Uh, and during crisis, uh, such uh, information flow, you know, like very abundance, which actually increases in the time of crisis. Um, and then we're looking at uh, effective information management, right? And also, I think uh, nowadays, exploring the use of artificial intelligence for a more efficient and systematic approach to information processing, including during crisis or as a crisis responses, also is of interest of the foreign ministries uh, that carry out diplomacy. It's part of it. Um, I think, especially for COVID-19 pandemic, as this is a transnational issues, um, it needs to have, uh, again, back to the partnership and to collaboration, collaborative action between and among the countries is also very crucial as well. And to answer to your question um, from moderator, uh, how uh, we can actually collect, uh, collect data from diverse or big population, we can uh, always step into the non-conventional data uh, I think in terms of crisis and mitigating the crisis, we need to be able to be innovative, to be creative and non-conventional data sources is a way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Femi Sumantri. And the same question for Dr. Steve McFeely, your opinion about this. Thank you. Well, I think the real challenge that faces governments is how to marry different data sets together. So not just big data, but what we've seen is in often cases, big data on their own aren't enough. So the real challenge is how to marry big data with traditional data sources so that we bring broader context to the information. And I think this is back to the points that the previous speakers have made. Governments, first of all, they have to think about why do they want the data, and I think they have to they have to explain that to their populations very carefully. Um, you know, because populations have genuine concerns around privacy. But so the, there's a challenge between understanding the the rights of the individual and the the broader benefits of the community. So governments need to think about then the, the infrastructure that's required, and the infrastructure can be legal, but, and it also can be technical. And um, so they have to think about storage, transmission, dissemination, but they really have to think around transparency around the communication. Why are they collecting the data? What data are they collecting? What are they gonna do with the data? 
how will those how will those data be used? And I think that, that that's really the cre the crucial bit for government, so that they, they they explain to their population and they reassure their population that what they're doing is proportionate and is justified. Thank you, Doctor. I I really love the way you say uh, it has to be transparent for the government because it also related with our third question from the floor. Um, I would like to address this again to Professor Cornelio Biola. It's about um, how during this pandemic we become so independent, uh, so dependent with the big data to face the pandemic, to conquer the pandemic. But what about the human rights of privacy? Because some of countries in the world has not um, have their privacy act as their regulation. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, I think it's a crucial aspect um, in terms of um, the safety of the data that is being used. The speed of the pandemic forced governments to react quickly. They needed information in real time. And that allowed, I think, under these emergency measures, um, uh, allowed governments to collect or to harvest a lot of data in order to understand where is the pandemic moving um, on the health aspect, but also what I mentioned, the question of disinformation, who is spreading it uh, and what to do about it. For instance, in one case in UK, at some point, the government decided that the disinformation campaign that was started by a hostile country was so toxic, was so problematic because it was supposed to undermine the vaccination campaign that they uh, wanted to use techniques that they used in Syria on digital. This can conflict sharply, right, with questions of data privacy. And I think here you need, again, a very clear regime about how data is being used. Uh, so uh, to what extent the data, um, uh, and that was a conflict, especially in, uh, also in UK, because the problem for the UK government was if they deploy this kind of approaches that are used in combat fields, right, digital combat fields, then they are not allowed to do it against UK citizens. Uh, so they, they had to navigate quite carefully. As I mentioned, this information is not only start, this doesn't only start uh, from abroad, but it's also amplified domestically. So that type of balance of how to react as something that is being promoted from abroad to something that is promoted by your own citizen, it's, it's a conundrum. It has not been solved properly, I'm afraid, at the moment. And they think, uh, even right in UK or in Europe, and they think that is another lesson that we draw from this. Uh, how to prepare legislation for conditions in which you have this kind of uh, info war situation that actually affects you. As for um, uh, uh, the other aspect that was raised before, um, I think you know this kind of agreements have become more and more important. Let me give you an example. So the European Union signed the data equivalency uh, agreement with the United States. It signed it twice. And uh, so that, you know, information collected about your nationals and transferred in the US jurisdiction for process for being processed could be done legally. And guess what? That agreement failed twice at the European Court of Justice because the legislation, the national security legislation in the US is that it's not comparable with that in Europe. So at the moment, this is what you know Europe and the Biden administration try to do is to come up with the new situations uh, that allow this kind of transfer the data. Data transfer has become critical uh, 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 and the national le security legislation of various countries are not compatible. That's another important aspect. It's not only about the crisis of the pandemic, but we're going to have different other crises in the future. And data transfer are critical to be arranged before the crisis. Thank you, Professor. And we have the fourth question. I would like to address this question to Dr. Anas. In Indonesia, we have various governmental institutions which possesses 
and overlapping data on the exact same subject, how do we, how we could address the interwitted situation? Please, Dr. Anas. Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, moderators. Yeah. One thing I will uh, say that uh, the issue of the security data is very, very important because, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the platform, uh, many, many platforms in Indonesia, the data, uh, individual data uh, must be protected. Yeah. So two things, I think, for the protected. One, uh, we must improve the Cyber security and the second, uh, how to uh, make a regulation to protect the individual data. About your question about the overlapping data, you know, maybe in Indonesia we have uh, many, many uh, applications. We have many, many uh, uh, platforms uh, that uh, collecting the data from the public, the collecting data from the government also collecting data from the another side yeah. so uh, in our uh, roadmap uh, we 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 uh, will build uh, one health system one health system yeah regarding to the uh, data one health data indonesia and in in health i i it means that we also develop the uh, one health data for the uh, uh, health uh, site and another side uh, we also will uh, simplification make simplification the system yeah that's uh, conducting in uh, government so no many many system again okay. this is very important to how uh, uh, simplify the system and so uh, to simplify the um, mechanism of the data collecting thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Anas. And I would like to also um, ask Dr. Steve McFeely to share your opinion. Uh, you've been working with the UN for so many, so long. And how do you see the pandemic change the organization, the big organization, international organization, use of big data? Thank you. Um, I think I think that's a very good question. Um, I think at the moment we're still reflecting on that question. So it's it's important to learn lessons uh, from the pandemic. Um, so I, I guess at the moment we're reflecting on what needs to change. Like what lessons have we learned? Um, if if we were faced with another crisis, what would we do differently? And I think it comes back to some of the questions and, and some of the answers that. Um, some of the other speakers gave. I think we need to think more in advance about the infrastructure that we need, um, both legal and technical. Um, we need to think as well about how to address both information to inform the crisis, but how to tackle the misinformation that was disseminated on the crisis. So that there's two separate issues, how to make our data better but also maybe how to mitigate the, the damage done by, by misinformation. We definitely need to think about the skill set. Um, so I'm a statistician, but I think increasingly we, we see with big data that we need more data science uh, within the UN, not just statistical skills. Um, and we also need to think about the legislation um, in advance. So as I said, we're currently looking at um, a new UN data governance compact. And one of the issues would be kind of what legislation do countries need to put in place either at a time of emergency or, or more routinely that allows them to access data, what type of data, how do they share data safely? So all of these issues that um, the, the other speakers have highlighted this impacts on the UN as well and on the kind of broader global governance discussion. How, how do we put all of these places, all of these issues in place to reflect? And just one last thing, in terms of preparedness, I think we need to rethink as well what preparedness means because traditionally 
we've thought about preparedness in the context of a crisis that we didn't expect. So an earthquake, a pandemic. But now I think we also need to start preparing for what we know is going to happen. So now we still have the preparedness issues on unexpected crises, but we also have the climate crisis, which at this stage, I think there's compelling evidence that we know it's going to come. So we need to start developing a different type of preparedness response for a crisis that we know that's coming. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steve McFeely. And my fifth question, it might be the last question if uh, depends on the time because we are almost having a 75 minutes that I've been given uh, from the organizer to Ms. Femi Sumantri, how can the government guarantee the safety of data collected officially? Since we heard more about data leaks more often recently, and could it be affect one's um, consent to provide their information through the application? Yeah, thank you for the question. I guess it's similar to what other speakers already mentioned earlier that uh, the law is very much fundamental in this and the legislation has also needs to be enforced, not also created or prepared. Um, that's the first thing. And on that security, it's something that I have to admit that it's something that we have been advocating for quite some time and it's not an easy task as well um, because of uh, many things basically. Uh, but then again, I suppose this is also in realization of the, 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 the needs of data and the importance of data uh, during the, the, the COVID-19 response as well. I hope that uh, there will be a lot of lessons learned uh, taken away by the government of Indonesia to be specific uh, or any other government basically in the context of uh, data collection and uh, related to data security and other um, data ethics that uh, needs to be, you know, to be embedded into the legal or uh, legislation in the country. Um, I'd like to mention something as well that uh, I guess uh, improving data infrastructures will also a key issues as well, because uh, it will also support the increasing need for accountability of uh, the international humanitarian, um, development assistance, as well as uh, a direct inter intervention from the country itself. So uh, I guess when, whenever this discourse is a race and also uh, people are aware of this, especially the government, uh, this could be leading into um, how data will be more securely used. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Femi. And the sixth question, uh, I would like to address this to Professor Cornelio Biola. I remember you once said that data is the new oil. <laughs> Watch, I've watched one of your YouTube. Um, the, sixth, the next question is, those who has data rules the world. However, data accuracy often experiencing difficulties in check and balance. How the bureaucracy should work to deal with this problem in ensuring data accuracy and accountability? Uh, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think I started you know, thinking about digital diplomacy a few years ago. But the more I learn now about the new trends, I think you know, the right term as we move forward is data diplomacy. Data has become critical and has different facets. We speak about agreements that needs to be put in place. We need about a normative framework around it that has to be negotiated with different stakeholders, domestic and international. We need to talk about institutions to govern uh, the way in which data is being uh, deployed domestic and internally. I also like to call attention to something that was mentioned also by the speakers. Data, especially with the new trends, it's not a big data, AI, machine learning. It's getting a very technical and very complicated. For Ministry of Foreign Affairs and policymakers, an important aspect is to make sure that there is language 
by which this kind of technical aspect can be easily translated to policy makers. Part of the reason that there is a decoupling from the way in which data can serve decision making and the fact that it's not being used is a lack of common shared language. Policymakers often don't understand what is being what they are being told. So one reaction to this is that you know the increased presence and the way uh, of, of, of digital of data of statisticians uh, in 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 uh, in uh, uh, executive boards. So uh, as as I think you know moving forward, I think that will be probably uh, one new concept which I like to uh, explore. Uh, uh, um, in the context of crisis management or data diplomacy. And we're going to see, you know, more and more, we're going to hear more and more about how data uh, is actually being, uh, or, you know, negotiated internationally, as I mentioned before, and how it's being used by governments around the world in an ethical and legal framework, safe legal framework. Thank you, Professor. And I think the question, uh, the answer from Professor Cornelio Biola also wrapping up our panel today. I would like to summarize before I close this panel. I have a certain points uh, collected from the panelists before. The first one is collaboration in collection. Uh, collaboration in collecting big data is a must. So government need to collect data from their embassies and partnership, of course, should have a clear agreement. And the second point that I get from the panelists is we need to prepare the legislation to have effective law for the use of data. And of course, we have to improve our data infrastructure and of course the human resource and the most important thing is for government to collect data and use the data they have to be transparent maybe some of you still want to take notes um, you can google all of my four panelists they are very prominent you can find them on youtube it's very easy to Google their name if you want to know more about big data and about crisis management. And with these four speakers in the panel and your responses through the chat box, as well as the questions, indeed the session has brought a new light to the term of big data and the importance of crisis management. It has been an honor for me to be able to moderate this session Thank you for all our panelists. I'm Cheryl Tansil, and thank you very much. This is the closing of our panel session four. Thank you. Thank you for coming.